I'm Caesar Philip Peters, and um, so thank you for joining my talk on the future direction of OpenACC support in GCC. So today I'll be discussing, you know, just briefly covering what is OpenACC, uh, and then what are our plans for merging our new OpenACC functionality in GCC 9, and what type of performance you can expect. And then we're going to look ahead to GCC 10 with OpenACC 2.6 and automatic parallelization with uh, ACC kernels. So what is OpenACC? It's just basically a set of language directives uh, and runtime support. And it yeah, allows the user to more easily utilize multiple devices, either you know, multiple host CPU cores or even discrete GPUs. So as an example, I have a, a mesh multiplication just written in C, uh, four lines, you have three loops. Matrix C is equal to the product of matrix A times B. And so that, that's how a user will start off with. And then if you want to accelerate that to run on a GPU, you can add those three directives that are highlighted in blue. So that this part over here, the uh, parallel, means it's instructing the compiler to offload that body of that for loop into a offloaded function for a device. And then you'll see these loop directives. So you have parallel loop gang, loop worker, loop vector. Those are to instruct the compiler to uh, generate codes that per execute the loop on the GPU across the different threads. And OpenAC offers three levels of parallelism, gangs, workers, and vectors. If you're coming from a CPU world, you can kind of think of gangs like a Linux process. Workers are like P threads, and vectors are like SIMD units. So one thing you might pick up from here is the reduction variable. I, the OpenAC version has a new induction variable of T. It's not, it doesn't actually do the reduction on CIJ. And it's just a weird quirk in the spec. For some reason, you can't have array elements inside of the reduction variable, so that's why you have a temporary there. But for the most part, you can see that you're augmenting to code. You're not completely rewriting it. So moving on to the new functionality <coughs> we're going to be introducing in GC9. And this is more so of a preview of what to expect. And also, because we're trying to merge our changes from OG8 branch, uh, there's quite a few of them. Actually, there's like over 75 individual patches. But some are small, some are big. But I'm just going to provide a, uh, an overview of the larger patches. So one of the bigger changes is the support for OpenAC 2.5. At present, GC only supports uh, OpenAC 2.0 and GC8. So one of the bigger changes is the data cloud semantics. And, uh, in OpenAC 2, there was uh, two variants of every data cloud. So there's copy and there's present or copy. What present or copy meant was if the variable has already been loaded on a device, then don't bother uploading it again. And as you see in this little code snippet, there's a external data uh, region, and then there's a parallel loop that copies that variable. In OpenAC 2.0, that'll be a uh, error because variable var is already live on the GPU. But in 2.5, it's it's perfectly acceptable. So the next set of big changes are going to involve Fortran. So GC8 has some missing support for AC routines, specifically you can't use routines inside modules and also routines uh, tell the, have a, uh, support a gang worker vector clause and that's important for the back ends, like for MVPTX, especially when we go to the uh, vector lengths extensions, which I'll show in a couple of slides. Uh, the compiler has to generate special code for different levels of parallelism and uh, right now it's just executing everything sequentially. So the next step is AC declare. So declare is used to specify where you want to place the variables. Like if you have a global variable, and you only want to use that variable on a GPU, then you can declare that variable as being GPU only. And again, that's that create clause is missing in Fortran. Maybe some other stuff too. And lastly, there's uh, some changes for AC update. That's if you have a variable already on a device, but you don't want to copy it back to the host, so you can just say update this variable on the host or device. And 
Update's kind of strange because it supports drive type objects in Fortran. And that's the only clause that supports drive type objects, except in 2.6. But the problem there is that use of drive type is not compatible with deep copy, which I'll be talking in a couple of slides. So the next big change is going to involve asynchronous execution. So in OpenMP, there's only one asynchronous queue. It's just all the you have to wait, or or there's no wait queue, I guess. With OpenAC, it's a little bit more tailored, like after GPUs, and at least on CUDA for the MPTX target, it has the concept of multiple streams of execution. It's basically, you can think of a stream as an offloaded function or program. And you can run multiple GPU programs at any given instance. So that's why you have the wait in and wait async, or async in. So one of the problems we had for our initial implementation was uh, async was that because libcomp proper only has a single queue, we uh, were managing all the async operations in the MVPTX plugin. And we ran into some bugs in the earlier NVIDIA drivers. Uh, the, basic, the driver would supposed to have a re allow us to register a callback function so that whenever the GPU finished running that stream, it will notify the host, but that wasn't working. So then we came up with a workaround for that. And the long story short is even though we support the async, operation is really, if you have more than one stream, everything runs sequentially. So, uh, Chung Lin, he's in our team at Mentor, uh, came up with a new approach and he made async, uh, these concept of async keys as a first class citizen in LibComp. And he added a couple of generic hooks for the plugins to implement. And at first this kind of seems like it's specific to OpenAC or or MVPTX, but other GPUs would need it too. So moving on to some MVPTX uh, runtime launch geometry issues. So there are actually two problems. So first of all, the issue here is there's two different ways that you can specify the what I call the geometry of the OpenAC kernels. And by geometry, I mean the number of gangs, number of workers, and, and the size of the vector. So one way is uh, OpenAC provides explicit clauses that the user can write, like num gangs, whatever, num workers, vector length. If the user doesn't admit, um, include those clauses, then it's up to the runtime to select something. So the big problem here is what should a runtime select? And the other issue is, so there's cases where the user can actually over request resources that the GPU just doesn't have. And with NVIDIA at least, it'll gladly, the driver will gladly accept that uh, request, but then at runtime it'll crash. It, it'll give you some obscure error message. So the fix there was to teach the runtime how to detect that problem and say recompile your program with fewer num gangs or num workers or whatever. So anyway, before I go to the default uh, launch geometry, probably makes sense to discuss how the GPU works, at least on NVIDIA GPUs. So that little figure over there is comes from NVIDIA's GP100 white paper. It's the P stands for Pascal, it's the previous generation, well, two generations now, um, old GPU. So those green squares are what CUDA call, or NVIDIA calls threads. And you can, there should be 32, but I'm just abstracting there, so I, I don't want to make the picture too complicated. Uh, so you see there's two warps. So, uh, oh, before we get to that, CUDA offers um, three levels of, well, uh, CUDA, the programming language uh, has a concept of something called blocks. Each SM unit can execute multiple blocks, and the blocks are, are independent from one another, and they map onto ACC gangs. Below blocks, you have something called warps. Uh, it's just a, warps are a collection of threads. Uh, each warp has 32 threads, actually. And as I'll show on the next slide, we were mapping warps to um, vectors, but we 
change that. So anyway, the, the whole point here is uh, you can see that there's, at any given time, there's two warps or the next scene parallel. But because you can, a block can have uh, more than one warp assigned to that, uh, to the actual hardware, like multi-threading, you, um, all those warps have to share that register file resource. So the more registers that a function uses, the fewer number of concurrent warps that can execute. Likewise, you see that shared memory is a shared resource. So the more shared memory a function uses, then the fewer number of gangs you can run concurrently. So anyway, the solution to both of these problems actually was to use the CUDA thread occupancy calculator. And that's something that Tom and I implemented just recently in GCC. And moving on to the vector lengths uh, stuff. This is all MVPTX specific too. But I included it here in case anyone else wants to implement OpenAC and GPUs so that they can see it, how we're doing this. So the thing here is that OpenAC has that vector length clause. And sometimes the user wants to put a larger vector, or request a larger vector length. In this case, it's 128. So in GC8 and earlier, vector length was fixed at 32. And in some respects, Vector length is kind of redundant because you can fake large vectors by using combined AC worker vector loops and creatively selecting num workers. The problem with that is OpenAC's execution model. So in this execution model, when you have gangs, are, when gangs aren't associated with an ACC loop, they run in something called redundant manner. So that means that all the gang threads can execute that instruction that's not in the loop. On the other hand, when workers encounter non-loop instructions, it, they behave as only one worker thread and one vector thread um, exists on the hardware. So consequently, you, know, you see that TID.Y, TID.X, those are the dimensions of the um, CUDA blocks. And we just use the Y for vector and X for worker. But you see that we had to have some predication there to implement that worker singer mode and vector singer mode. So in terms of the actual implementation, GC9 will support vector lengths up to 512 um, threads in size, with the restraint that it has to be a positive multiple of 32, which is the warp size. And this is kind of uh, MVPTS specific, but we're basically treating vectors as workers now. And so if you look back at the previous slide, you saw that the there's a warp scheduler that can manage 32 threads concurrently. And that, so those threads can get, so even though all those threads are um, fetching the same instruction, they can be masked out and they may not be, it, the warp can come divergent, but the hardware will try to reconverge that warp as fast as possible. Or um, on the other hand, you might have multiple warps inside a CUDA block. The hardware does not make any attempts to coordinate those warps, so these have to place manual barriers to do that. So then, that's one change in vectors now to use the bar sync instructions to synchronize. And the other thing is, when you uh, propagate the vector single state to vector partition, you, you now need to use shared memory, whereas before, PTX offered some um, um, warp broadcast instructions. So that's another little change. So one thing I want to mention here is that when we implement the, well, we, that's Tom and I, when we implement the uh, larger vector lengths, we ran into some synchronization bugs. And it's just kind of weird how those weren't apparent when vector lengths was fixed at 32 might have been using barriers within barriers that's caused the issue. So there are a couple of limitations. So the first one is that the reduction finalizer, that's after you in, um, sum all the intermediate reductions for the, uh, values for the, um, all the threads in the vector. They all use an atomic um, update instead of doing something with parallel um, uh, tree type reduction. 
it's, it should be easy to fix, but we just didn't go around to it. And then the next thing that GCC doesn't automatically use large vector lengths, so it's one of those things now where the compiler has to, or the user has to explicitly request uh, large vector lengths for it to be activated. So the next change is this concept of gang local memory. So you notice over here you have loops, the outer loop is gang, the inner loop is worker. And the thing over here is the local array is a gang. And in GCC 8, whenever you, uh, the state propagation uh, broadcasts variables, it always it used to broadcast them to private um, local variables. It doesn't have like this, um, you know, a global variable for each gang worker or vector. The problem over here is like, each worker will have its own copy, right? So then after the worker loop exits, and if the gang tries to access the uh, array elements, it really only get, it gets that I module worker size size elements in that array. So the solution here was to introduce a new OAC and then there's a GoAC target hook that calls the I guess implement better back end and at least on the PTX back end it moves that variable into shared memory. And shared memory, is, like you saw before, it's a small buffer size, so it really doesn't make sense placing the arrays in gangs, but we had one program that uses it, so we had to fix it. So moving on to first private reductions. In the earlier version of the spec, there was some debate whether reduction variables behave like data clauses. That means that when you enter a parallel region or a kernel's region, should that value, reduction variable value be copied to and from the accelerator? And I guess the conclusion we came out in the GCC six time frame was that all reduction variables needed a data clause. But as you'll see later in the performance study, uh, you'll see that this, ex Unnecessary copying of reduction variables or private variables. This is clearly private because it's data on entry. Uh, it wastes GPU bandwidth and it actually slows down the program. So I, we at Mentor worked with the OpenAC technical committee and said that or agreed upon that only the outermost loop needs to have a data clause associated with it. Otherwise, the inner loop can go with what they call the predetermined sharing rules for uh, variables. In this case, temp will be first private. So in one case, that DGMV from BLAS greatly benefits from this. So moving on to C and C++ dynamic arrays. So this is kind of strange because in OpenACC and OpenMP has something called a uh, concept of a subarray, which is you don't want to upload the whole array to the accelerator, you can just say upload this small extent of it. And usually it wants that subarray to be contiguous. But as you know, dynamic arrays don't necessarily contiguous, so we had to add support for that. So uh, the way that Chunglin implemented this was he introduced a new comp map dynamic array um, type all the various, this is a class of types. Um, and then during OMP lowering, the compiler created a struct with the uh, array descriptor of the dynamic array and passed that to the runtime. And then the runtime uh, populates that array on the accelerator. And for the most part, it works, but it doesn't have uh, handle, uh, support things like pointers to the array of rows yet. <coughs> No one complained about that, so. So moving on to the performance, like what can you expect in GCC 9? And this actually came from one of our customers and they're interested in something called 
a, a quantum chemistry simulator called Alice Dalton. And initially it came to us, is, I think it was because it wasn't working. And the reason why it wasn't working is it was using that deep copy um, semantics that OpenAC didn't support. And I, I included a passion there to get a work around that, but really uh, that issue hasn't been resolved in the spec until OpenAC 2.6, which was released like two months after that I started this project. So anyway, this is a non-trivial program, and it runs on supercomputers. I don't know much about chemistry, so I can't really discuss it that deep, much detail. But you know, once I resolved that issue, uh, my manager and I, Randy Allen, we compared our, this performance of GCC against uh, another compiler, production OpenAC compiler, and we noticed that GCC was performing pretty lousy. And you know, we analyzed all the use of OpenAC, and we saw that that only accounted for a small portion of the time. So in order to make this e even more unfair on GCC's side, we replaced the use of uh, BLAS, um, PGEM, and DGEMV functions with a modified version from NetLib where we uh, added OpenAC parallel directives. It actually made GC the program worse, initially. And then some more details on this. There's only one method that we concentrate on. It's called DEC RI MP2. MP2. Um, that's the only production where the OpenACC simulation that the program supports. So in terms of performance enhancements, there are actually four of them that I um, worked on. Well, three. One of them came from Jakob uh, that benefit this program during that couple of months that I worked on it. So the first one was a uh, annoying PTX JIP bug um, that we have a workaround for it in GCC. Um, NVIDIA is generally pretty responsive on uh, supporting or resolving their bugs, but it takes a couple of months, so we try to work around those issues when we can. And, but the original workaround had a, another bug that forced that code or, to only work with float store, and that really hurt DGEM a lot. And the second optimization was uh, utilized the PTX parameter space. So parameter space, uh, so first of all, to get an idea why that is important is when you call offload functions, you're basically using the pthread uh, method to pass arguments to threads. Basically, you create a structure uh, with all the remap data var uh, variables, uh, addresses, or points to variables, and then you pass it over to the GPU. Now, with for PTX, CUDA offers a function called CU launch kernel, and that takes in a variable number of parameters. And if you use, if you pass in individual parameters, the, that function will upload those variables directly to the cache. So that has two implications. First. You know, when you populate, when you pass everything by a struct, you got really got to first allocate memory for that struct, and then you have to pass it, upload all the variable inside that struct to it on the device. So that's two operations. Whereas if you use the driver API, like you see a launch kernel with the individual parameters, then the driver automatically uploads everything to the cache. And then there's other implications, like when you're on the GPU, if all the threads access the cache, you're not using memory, uh, global memory bandwidth, so it's a little bit quicker on initialization. But the way I implemented it in GCC wasn't portable. I did everything in OMP lowering, and that caused problems with the host because you had to use the BFFI to um, call offloaded functions, and then with GCN coming up, um, it wasn't beneficial there. So if I were to rewrite, uh, redo this optimization, I'd probably have to make it similar, similar to the scalar replacement of aggregates pass and just make that MVPTF specific. And then lastly, because this is an open source project, we benefit by Jakob's uh, 
coalesce the vice um, chancellor. So before Jacob implemented this path, uh, this optimization, whenever libgomp detected a variable to upload to the accelerator, it would do so immediately. So first it'll allocate memory for it, and then it'll transmit it. And after this pass, uh, you, libgomp will copy that variable to a local buffer on the host, and then once all the that local buffer has been populated, then it'll transfer, it'll reserve memory for that on the device, one big block, and then transfer that big block onto the accelerator. And that has two advantages. First, one malloc, malloc's are kind of slow on a GPU. And second, the block transfer is faster than individual transfer. So here's some performance numbers from the GC7 branch, because remember this is early, or late last year. And so our baseline numbers was about 231 seconds, and then after the PTX JIT uh, workaround was corrected, we dropped it down to 136 seconds. And then with the PTX parameter optimization, we dropped it down to 112 seconds. And then just by changing the, uh, that reduction of, to be first private, dropped it down to another six seconds. And then Jakobs further reduced it down to 102 seconds. And all these um, tests were run on the GeForce 1080, which is just a high-end desktop GPU at the time. I didn't want to include it over here because uh, this is a new cauldron, but if you Google Mentor and Alice Dalton, you'll see my manager's blog post comparing against other compilers, and you see GCC actually does pretty good. So looking ahead at GCC 10 and beyond, um, our immediate goal is to add support for OpenAC 2.6. And one of the major features in that new spec is that deep copy. So deep copy is anything that involves stuff like structs, um, maybe C++ um, objects, and Fortran derived types. So over here you see a copy clause, and you see uh, s.scale and s.data and some subarray. The trick here is you need to upload the individual fields within that struct. You also need to transfer that containing struct to the device. And there really wasn't a well-defined um, format in the earlier versions of OpenACC. That's why what I said the update wasn't working when the stride type in Fortran. Well, not working, but um, not sufficient for uh, deep copies because it only transferred that individual field, not the whole um, struct. And that's what you need for the more generic copy clauses. Next, there's something brewing called heterogeneous memory management. It's basically virtual memory across GPUs and CPUs. So you can use host pointers on the GPU. Uh, there's not that much impact in OpenHC because if I'm not mistaken, it's just basically cheats everything like a shared memory device and that's how the host is. So if anything, that should make stuff like deep copy easier. And lastly, there's a new serial construct which is basically a parallel region with num gangs, num workers, and vector lane set to one. And then, in addition to any support for OpenAC 2.6, we're also going to enhance kernels. So, kernels are a little bit different from parallel in that they allow the compiler to automatically find um, any parallelization in and uh, generate code for it. For instance, ideally, if the user says SC kernels on that mission multiplication, it'll automatically treat it like as if the user implemented all those parallel and explicit HC loop clauses. So, you know, the, if you look at the parallel code, that's kind of like a prescriptive uh, nature of like open AC directors, whereas kernels is more descriptive of how to solve the problem. And note that this isn't a source to source compiler. Um, GCC would generate you know, source to execute um, assembly. So it just, just shows what you want to happen. So in phase one of our kernels, um, implementation strategy, 
we want to at very least expose where all the HC loops are or inside the kernels region. And at least initially, we're going to concentrate on the, all the for loops in C and C++ and all the do loops inside Fortran. And there's other loops. Right? You can have go to statements. You can have while loops. But we're going to concentrate on for and do for the time being. And we want to convert all the kernels regions to parallel regions because parallel code runs pretty good already. So you notice over here, we, we ultimately want to translate the AC kernels to AC parallel. But you note that we have a special auto clause. And that's not new to GCC. C or OpenAC rather, it's been around since at least 2.0. But right now in GCC, whenever it sees the auto clause, it just punts and uh, treats it as it's a sequential loop. And that's part two, is to actually optimize those auto clauses. And based on our experience implementing kernels in the R loops pass, uh, number one, we need stronger data dependency analysis. But I think the major problem that we ran into was that the subscripts were in the proper uh, representation. This is for Fortran, because Fortran, you know, multiple dimensional uh, loops are always lowered into a single dimensional array. And the chain of reference um, analysis couldn't identify the subscripts and it always detected nothing or uh, false dependencies. So one idea I was floating, and it's still kind of early, is to do more of the analysis during simplification or maybe before it. And there's one of the advantages of doing that is we can use a common like high level syntax of um, array subscripts so you can actually preserve what the user wrote. And then if you get the lively events information during gamification, that's also when we're setting up all the um, data clauses for you know, all the implicit data clauses that the user didn't write in OpenAC. So for that reduction variable, if you know it's, it's not live on entry, then we won't make it first private. It'll just to private, and that would further speed up that um, LS Southern program. So, in conclusion, I just want to show that you know, mentors committed to OpenACC is not going to be dropped any time soon in terms of support by us. So, we are pushing a lot of patches up right now. Uh, you probably saw Julian and I um, posting a couple patches a day. And then GCC, we're, GCC 9 is going to have much better performance in terms of OpenAC on GPUs than the previous versions. And as Andrew's going to show in a couple uh, hours from now, OpenAC is going to work on other GPUs too. So, any questions? I still have the, the front end IL, yeah. so the whole array expression stuff. Maybe just repeat what you said because Okay. So yeah, I think with the dependence analysis and the fact that we everywhere lower accesses into pointers and lose the multi dimensional indexing, which I think all dependence analysis frameworks depend on. Um, we do have this question, uh, the, this uh, complication in the regular auto power in graphite in the high level loop optimizers. Yeah. So it's, it's not the first that you run into this issue. So for Fortran, one, one of the solutions would be to just move the open ACC lowering to the state where the, the lower, the, the scalarization has not yet been done. I'm not sure if the Fortran front end is organized in a way that you have um, a phase where you could put in 
a lowering and see the whole function with the lowering not yet applied. I think the lowering is done as part, uh, the scatterization is done as part of generating generic and not not on on the Fortran IL itself. So maybe there is a phase where you can do the OpenACC stuff. It won't help you with C and C++. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, the, the, does that run really after the parsing on the thing, or? Yeah, we have the front end uh, optimization pass or passes. Uh, it runs after resolution, so everything's fixed, and it does a source to source transformation for several things like inlining Matmol, for example, or eliminating double double function calls in a single statement. And uh, that would be the perfect place to put it. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm all for that. So I think it's, it's better than doing, trying to do it at gamification time. So yeah. if, you, if you try to do it that early, then do it where it's even more proper, even if it's then only Fortran. You probably can do full lowering at, at that phase, but perhaps just mark up that this is this in to so add some new artificial yeah, the other statements the, or comments and, and, and the, use them later on during the gamification and OMP lowering later. Yeah, you, you, and, and of course the other remark that it would be good to actually preserve the multidimensional arrays into the middle end, uh, that is of course has been a subject for as long as GFortran has been around. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe 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 we should have another go at it. Uh, the problem is that this this uh, scalarization stuff is uh, rather scary. Um, so, but yeah, we can we can have it another go. And if, if, if uh, Paul Thomas is here, he should he should come in today. We can discuss this, I think. So the the, the issue I run into is the of course the, the 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 array descriptor stuff and taking the views with the different strides, and it doesn't really fit into um, how we can represent the, the array range ref so we don't have um, uh, the ability to to really get at all the details especially the the, the, the offsetting so I yeah so I, I, basic things kept working but the more interesting ones broke uh, with my simple attempt And in, in that case, um, maybe maybe to get something work at all, it might be better to have an 80% an solution than have no solution at all. Because I mean, all the strides and parts of arrays, we could still do the old way. And uh, for whole arrays or, or, comp or contiguous arrays, with the, some things that would be actually easier, we can we can do it faster. And then maybe later work on. Because I don't think very many people use use matrix multiplication on on uh, arrays with strides. That makes no sense. <laughs> Because you would have to copy the arguments anyway. Hey, uh, Actually, if, 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 if you look at, at spec, you know, um, there's too much stuff passed in as descriptors where, you, where the compiler doesn't know it's actually continuous because people don't put continuous on their array declarations, right? Yeah, and, and, and maybe we, this is also something that we should work on. Any other questions? Sessions being recorded. Uh, yes, they are. Um, Simon and uh, well, Simon will tell you more because he's doing. Yes.